everyone. Welcome. I'm Walt from 101 WKQX. Thanks for coming to the Sound Lounge. A lot of times we do bands in here and they play and it's really cool, but I think what we have going on today is even cooler. <laughs> Are you guys ready for this? Yeah! All right. Please welcome Billy Joe Armstrong, Mike Dern, Trey Cool, Green Day! <laughs> Guys, welcome. Thanks for coming and doing this. This is awesome. Thanks. Hey, to... you're not Oprah. Uh, I know. <laughs> I, I feel like Phil Donahue today, though. Um, look, up, Everybody look under your chairs. Yeah. <laughs> so when you guys, let's go back to 1992. When you guys played here at McGregor's, did you ever think that one day you'd be playing the iconic Wrigley Field? Oh, my gosh. Uh, yeah, maybe sh like shortstop or something. Like, that would have been more <laughs> likely, I think. You're streaking. Yeah. Um, well, the first time we played McGregor's was 1990. Was it 90? Yeah, and then we played in, we played there like three or four times. It was all, I mean, what a fun place to play. But yeah. um, no, Wrigley, no. Never thought <laughs> in a million years. But pretty, I'm very happy about it. Pretty, pretty mind-blowing though, right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We got a lot of uh, listeners here and some staff mingled in. We got some people with some questions. Marconi, uh, you've got somebody with a question. Yes, Yachty. Hi, guys. Uh, great to meet you. Uh, big fan. Uh, my question is, what was your biggest inspiration writing Revolution Radio, and how would you say that it differs from when you first began? Um, I think when, it wasn't really, like, in inspiration, say, that we could, like, something we got triggered by going and going running to a mountaintop or anything like that. It was just more like the songs just showed up. And um, so we, we had Revolution Radio, and we had Bang Bang, and Somewhere Now, and then we were like, yeah, let's go for it and make a record. So, um, And as far as the way that it was, that's pretty much how it is every time. You know, there's never like some kind of solar eclipse that makes you want to like, <laughs> It just, the songs just kind of appear, and um, yeah, it's just, that's kind of how Green Day always operates, so. Lauren, you got a question? Hi, uh, whoa, sorry. Lauren from 101 WKQX. Speaking of Revolution Radio, I love the video, and I was wondering where the VHS footage of those shows on 924 Gilman Street came from, and then what it was like Revisiting. You don't know, <laughs> you don't know make, where the camera is. Make some stuff up. Probably a video camera. Yeah. <laughs> well, we, so. we have a, a documentary out called Turn It Around, and it's coming out right now. Um, actually, it's being shown in a lot of independent record theaters. I mean, I mean radio, uh, movie theaters. Um, and so Corbett Redford, who is the director, actually pulled together tons and tons of video footage. And it was actually just reaching out through fans and through YouTube and everything, just saying, if you have it, please give it to us and we can put it in this movie. So it's all out there and it'll be on the uh, Turn It Around movie. It's the history of where we come from. Has anyone here ever tried prednisone before? <laughs> yeah. I recommend it. It's it's pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, like, it's, it's a body high, man. <laughs> It's crazy, man. It's crazy. It's crazy, man. You have a dart in your neck. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of uh, Turn It Around, uh, the story of East Bay Punk, um, it's, how did you get involved in that? Well, whose idea was it to do this documentary? Well, it started off, I, I, I asked a friend of mine, that, and who ended up being the director, Corbett Redford, if he had, knew how to get some old footage of us from playing like a backyard party. And then all of us, because he's so um, creative and crazy, and uh, and he, he knows how to archive. Suddenly, all of this stuff started coming, in, and it was wasn't just us. It was also like stuff from like Rancid and Operation Ivy and Neurosis and Pansy Division. We were getting all of this stuff. We're like, well, why don't we just make an East Bay documentary? It seems like now's the time, and. Um, so, uh, yeah, our good friend Greg Schneider was the guy who also filmed and edited the whole movie also. So. You may know him from the hashtag shut up Greg. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you're saying that, uh, Mike, you're saying that it, it's coming out right now. Actually, the screenings in Illinois in our area are next Wednesday in Addison Gurney, Country Club Hills, and one other place. Uh, check eastbaypunk.com for all of those screening times. Uh, let's see. Uh, Lou, you have a listener who had a question. I do. Joshua has the next question for you guys. Hi, guys. So my question is, what is your most memorable moment on tour in Chicago? Dimitri. Dimitri. Yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Dimitri was a uh, very, very muscular male stripper. <laughs> who, uh, it was, it, he was a real sexy dancer, too. Uh, he, he danced on the stage at McGregor's with us. Um, in was, the middle of our set. Not yeah, after no. or before. There was, there was this woman, it was her birthday. Mm -hmm. And so her co-workers got a male stripper to come up in in the middle of our set and it went from like this funny thing that lasted about 30 seconds to like a 10 minute dance and it like the whole, everyone was it was the most awkward thing and i still i still can't unsee it i can still like smell it it's still have it's, it's it's cool i'm cool yeah if anybody out there uh that's listening right now can re remember was there please uh call in to um, the station right now. <laughs> Lou, you wanted to add something? Uh, yeah, you know, you guys, you've come to Chicago so many times. Uh, what is something, like, you've obviously had Chicago deep dish pizza before, right? You've yeah. been down that oh, road? Oh, my God, yeah. Okay, do you guys have any kind of rule before you jump on stage? Like, tomorrow night, Wrigley Field, is there a cutoff before you guys will dig into something, like, as heavy as deep dish? Because you guys put on a pretty strong show out there. Yeah, I mean... If, I, I don't want to shart on stage. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, you never know. You get a little older, these things happen more frequently, you know? It's like I have to put a limit on my Tums uh, intake. So uh, after the show is the perfect time for, for the deep dish. That's when you get crazy with it. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So you're working on... Uh, <laughs> I don't want to drop a deep right dish on the bus. <laughs> Yeah, there's no yeah, you yeah, can't You're not do allowed to deep dish on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> Number one only. Um, you were on uh, Revolution Radio. You actually produced this album yourself. After 20 plus years with Rob Cavallo, always being somewhere in the studio, not there this time. Um, no, he didn't. He also didn't do uh, the one with with, with Butch yeah, Big. Yeah, Butch Big did yeah. 21st Century Breakdown, and of course the stuff that we did um, on Lookout Records was. You know, three day. Well, uh, was it weird though? I mean, because you, you've done that said, you've done a lot. I with, always with keep in touch with Rob, and I, you know, I, I talk to him. We talk about music all the time, and um, I think like when I got my studio, and then we were just kind of farting around in there, sharting around in there, and <laughs> and then yeah. and finally we just started like it, it just it was just the three of us. It was it was comfortable, and we were having fun, so there was no reason to bring in anybody. No offense to Rob, because he's a great producer. Plus, right. the studio is actually really small, and Rob's like 6'3". Really? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not enough room for him. Yeah. Lou, you had a, another listener with a guest? I uh, do. Uh, we have Haley over here. Hi, guys. What's up? Okay, my question is, so you guys are one of the bands that a lot of people listen to when they're facing hard times. Uh, when you were younger, what did you listen to, and how does it make you feel that you're a band that a lot of people can turn to now? Well, I heard a lot of, like... I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> you know, and they got yeah, kind of. That always helps. Is that the question? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, go get yourself a switch. Uh, <laughs> anyone? My mother would beat me mercilessly to Hank Williams, mm. Jr. Ouch. <laughs> so that's what oh. I listen to during hard times. No, I mean. <laughs> That's what music is, an escape in some way, I guess, but I don't know, that's a hard question. What do you think, Mike, Michael Durnt? There were just certain songs. I didn't own a lot of records or certain songs, some cassette tapes and stuff. Uh, I think it came down to individual songs that you resonate with. I would record, actually record segments of radio and then delete over the songs I didn't like and keep the ones that I did. So, um, yeah, that was my first mixtapes that helped me through my adolescence. <laughs> <laughs> Don't cry out loud. That was a good one, yeah. See? <laughs> or I'll give you something to cry about. That's All it. That's, that's how it goes. All by myself. There's a mashup right there. Yeah. Lauren? Sorry. 
<laughs> I was enjoying that. We didn't just answer bury that question. Those emotions deep. In you. <laughs> just bury them. <laughs> just hide your feelings. With the show at Wrigley Field tomorrow night, which there are still tickets available too, by the way. Um, I've heard that the ivy is actually magical, and if you touch it, you get superpowers. So if you could choose your superpower, or poison, oak. Or poison ivy, <laughs> oh. I think it's a different kind. Um, but if you could choose your superpower, what would you want, and how would you use it? I would want a slam dunk. That's pretty cool. Never, never done that. Believe it or not, I mean, you're next. <laughs> uh, so I already have mine. It's called invisibility. Uh, Notice how you didn't comment? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I don't know. I got to say one thing that every time that uh, a, a team has won the world, it took them, every time a team has took a really long time to win a World Series, we were in town when they did. So. So I don't I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> so you already have the power. Uh, so yeah, what you're saying. Power. Um, um, I don't know. I don't want to be a superhero. Shit. <laughs> Oop, bleep. Um, I don't know. I would I would want to have been the person that invented prednisone. We well, you know like. <laughs> You know the Wonder Twins? The one would turn into an animal, the other one would turn into a some of kind of water? <laughs> Not that. <laughs> yeah. they, the Wonder Twins, were, what did, that was, they were useless. They're stupid. Worse than they, Aquaman. They always had a problem. Someone had to come in and like Superman had to come and bail them out. Mm -hmm. But Underdog, on the other hand, he had that ring with prednisone in it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we all know what he was doing. Yeah, yeah. Sweet Polly Purebred, man. She, she <laughs> got the effects of that. Marconi, you got a listener with a, with a question. Oh gosh. Hmm. That's man, you're geographically? <laughs> um, well, what's below Illinois? As far as baseball? Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey now. Hey now. Butter them up. <laughs> yeah. Um well, well, I mean gosh, we've always had like I remember the first time playing in um, Elmhurst, and, our, and we automatically already like being on Lookout Records. Only so many people like like the network of like alternative and punk crowds and stuff like that. They didn't. They it was limited to who actually was into Lookout, and and Chicago was a big. Uh, that that was like the first show we played out of town where, and it took a long time. I mean, if you think. All the towns in between we had to go through to get to, sh to a good show in Chicago. Mm -hmm. So, with that said, Chicago is very near and dear. Yeah, to the our music scene here and sharks. record shops, music scene in general. You know, everybody talks about it all around the country. So that probably plays into the fact that um, it's such an awesome place to play, whether you're in a van or playing Wrigley Field. Mm -hmm. it, it really is a, a great music town. Um, I want to jump on this point really quick because uh, you did build up a really great fan base early on, early days, without the internet. How did you do that? <laughs> well, um, we just went out and played. Ford Econoli. Yeah, I got in a van and, um, you know, when we were 17, 18, 19 years old and um, just it was like the, the DIY scene at the time where different people had exchanged numbers and um, you could get shows that way and we did it without, um, actually, it was very rare when we could play a club. Mm -hmm. um, we, we would always play like a vet's hall or a party or right. something like that. Um, so it was um, play, 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 play. Um, and uh, just have a lot of energy and and, I, and it never, like we, Always take like we always manage, manage to make the best of any given situation. With like, if there was two people there, try to find something about it that uh, was funny or fun, or bask in your your misery at the same time. So. <laughs> right, right. 
What do you think about the internet and the music business today? Because it has changed the business and the way it's done from when you guys first started. I think it's great. I think um, bands can be way more independent now than they ever have been before. I th and, and easier to find an audience because everything is niche on the internet. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's it's almost, it's the same concept as it was back then. It's just easier to get to people that are um, into music and and all that stuff. So. Yeah, you can find clubs to play a lot easier when you're traveling around. We used to rack up a heck of a phone bill I just bet. calling around different places and saying, what club would play this kind of music? And now we have the information superhighway instead of just a highway. Right. And, yeah. and touring is much easier when you have Yelp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're not going to want to play that club. Dimitri's there four nights a week. <laughs> <laughs> And he's old now. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that's one sausage been hanging a little too long. <laughs> <laughs> the things we can't unsee. <laughs> Picture it in our mind. Kevin, uh, I want to give the microphone to Steve. He's got a question. Oh, Steve, you got a qu or Yeah, you got I didn't know you had one. Uh, okay, this one does work. That one doesn't. All right, so uh, this is more for Mike. Mike, when you do your singing along with Billy, there's like this really cool harmony thing that you got going on. There, you're like right on the syllable, and it, it just you just kind of have like a big Green Day voice when you guys sing together, and it's really cool. I just wonder what's the inspiration for that? Where does that come from? Trey's drum beats. <laughs> well, just obviously, try and, just try and you know, there's a thing, there's a weird thing that happens when um when you're a lot of a lot of times it's very hard. Like I'll I'll uh, write a bass line and then try to play a. Uh, try to play that and Billy will say I got here's some harmonies we're thinking of or here's what I've got for harmonies of this song and I'll go wow I really should have written that bass line easier because um, it's really hard to do but once you get that feeling down it's really it's a neat thing to feel yourself singing playing one rhythm singing another um, it's just really gratifying it's a neat thing oh yeah thank you Mike and I when we first started Sweet Children or Green Day from the get-go we were into harmonies like right right from the start. Um, and I think that that was one thing almost in the back of our minds wanted to, uh, we wanted to set ourselves apart from the other bands is that nobody was really doing it from our, our scene per se. So. Was it like a Beach Boys type influence? Yeah, Everly Brothers. Oh yeah, Everly. Uh, Beach Boys, uh, Beatles yeah. mixed with like some Husker Du and stuff like that. We really love them, so. Sounds good, thank you. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Um, I was watching just a, a live show, just an old YouTube clip, and this is from the early 90s, and you guys are bouncing around. One of you falls down for about 30, 40 seconds in between a song, and then gets up, and you guys keep playing. And it was clear that something was wrong, but it didn't really matter. And then I keep thinking in the back of my mind, I'm a big pro wrestling fan. He's hurt. Like, they're going to keep going. He's hurt. They don't really care. And there's all these injuries you've probably gotten over the years just doing this show this way, at this scale, that hard. What's the worst injury you've gotten on stage? Mike? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I broke my nose on TV once. Uh, that, was, that was good. And then on TV, uh, mm -hmm. got tackled at Woodstock, broke, broke a bunch of teeth out, and chipped up my elbow and stuff like that. But um, again, the show must go on. You know, everybody gets hurt at their job at some point, whether it's your feelings or you actually cut your finger off. <laughs> you know, cut your finger off or whatever. People don't people don't cheer for most people while they're getting hurt. So that, that kind of hurts. It puts a little uh, bandage on it. If you, <laughs> Trey Put broke some, his water. Rub some dirt in it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually uh, chipped my tooth on Billy's kidney stone. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> didn't you drop a deep? Did, did, didn't you drop a deep dish in the middle of a show once? <laughs> We've created something new here. Dropping yeah. a deep dish. Um, let's see, Brian, you've got a listener with the question. We got uh, question. Janine right here for a question. Hi. Um, so, of all the places you've traveled to, what has been the most obscure food that you've tried and actually ended up enjoying? Oh, I'll eat anything. <laughs> oh, the thing we, that we ate that we ate? Like, like koala meat or something? Like something? Like oh, come on! Something, something. <laughs> Nobody eats koala. <laughs> Trey eat anything? Yeah. Yeah, any almost anything. We were we were in um, kidneys. I, I think we were in in Poland, or and they 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 said, "Hey, we got something from the chef for you." And they brought out a plate like, "Great, what is this?" He goes, "It's whale." I'm like, 
We're good, man. No, yeah. we're good. We're good. I draw the line at eating giant mammals. Yeah, I, I, you know, I like my deep dish pizza, man. You know, but I, I mean, I, I ate um, tongue. I, yeah, I actually enjoyed horse hot dogs in Slovenia. They had a little bloody dink on the end. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> you and Dimitri, man. <laughs> Bloody Dink. <laughs> it's a good band name. <laughs> the Bloody Dinks. Bloody Dinks. The Bloody Dinks. Brian? Now, since you guys are playing Wrigley tomorrow night, home of the World Series champion Chicago Cubs, Woo! applause, applause. At any point of the show tomorrow night, will you lead a seventh inning stretch? <laughs> and part two, if so, how do you channel the energy of Harry Carey? to lead, take me out to the ball game, Wrigley style. Well, the first thing you can't say, you, you can't say home team. You have to say root, root for the Cubbies. And I, I, I sang the seventh inning stretch, and I, and I said that. So I didn't get booed. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. But I don't know. God. Well, we got a... Uh, I mean, I'm not this, it's rock we got, and roll. We got a T-shirt with uh, like a kind of Harry Carey cat on it for the like, special for tomorrow. That's pretty awesome. Um, did uh, when you, when you do a live show, you bring this this thing where you bring a kid on stage and have him play guitar. Now, when did that start? How did that start? And do you ever th feel like it's not going to work out? Like that kid really doesn't know the parts. It's fine if it doesn't work out. It's total. It's it. Sometimes it's well. Sometimes it's catastrophic. But sometimes it's kind of funny. You know, as long as uh, it's all. Uh, um, anyways, the first time, the first time we ever did it was in New Orleans in uh, on the Insomniac tour. I was like, we were kind of having sh like a weird show, and we were, I don't know, maybe the crowd was not not involved, or you know, it was sort of. And then so I was said, screw it, I don't want to play. Does anybody else want to want to play the song? And some kid came up and did it, and it completely changed the show. I just think it just breaks down. It's like you're bringing the whole crowd on Absolutely. stage with you every time we do it so and you do a great job of like you know like pumping them up to give them the confidence because it's got to be weird for that kid to get in front of thousands of people when all he does is normally is play in front of his bedroom you know or something like that and suddenly he's playing in front of thousands he's got to you got you do a good job of giving him confidence to do that too yeah and uh it's nothing but downhill from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really, some kid, poor yeah. kid up. He's gonna be ten years old playing Wrigley Field, and then it's like, okay, what's your next gig, pal? Right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so is somebody gonna get that opportunity tomorrow? It's it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Has anybody ever? Have you ever brought somebody on up, and then now that they're in a band making music on their own that you know? Yes. Of? Oh yeah, we yeah? hear that all the time. There's a. There's people that come up. We brought a whole band up one time. We had them, we were playing Ramon song or something. And we, were, we brought a whole band up at one point. And they came back probably 10 years later and like, hey, we're in a band together now. And yep. same guys. Really? They became friends that night and became a band from then on. We're, there was one, want, one guy that's in a band now, a, a popular one, um, the 1970-something? 1975? The 1975. Yeah. He, I brought him up when he was a kid. And and so that was uh, wow. I heard about that. I could be totally wrong, <laughs> but somebody told me that. Didn't you bring a kid named Jimi Hendrix up on stage? I yeah. Yeah. Yes. Young kid, young guy. He seemed lefty. like he was on the right path to guitar. Right. Yeah, yeah. I had to show him a couple of things. <laughs> a couple of chords, a few prednisone later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He led your guitar on fire. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. Uh, Lauren, you've got a listener with a question. Yes, this is Olivia from Chicago. Hi, and actually, you are right about the 1975 thing. I, oh, I am. You are right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, so my question is, um, so Billy, is there a certain routine you do before every show? Something that pumps you up? <sighs> I guess it could be for all Panic things. Panic attack. Do the trick. Do, do the, the trick. <laughs> <laughs> the windmill. Uh, <laughs> I like uh, enough those. about Dimitri. <laughs> <laughs> I like to do this next thing called the bloody dink. Um, oh god, that was gross. I um, I just try to do everything I can to keep from freaking out. Um, and uh, just you know, I like one thing I've been doing lately is jumping rope, just to get ready to go on. It's uh, 
so that and just kind of warm up my vocal. Um, that's it. Marconi. Uh, Mr. Cool, <laughs> um, you've done so many yeah. crazy things over the years, like set your drums on fire. You were notorious on Letterman for doing stunts, which was one of my favorite things. Uh, do you have any plans on putting yourself in harm's way at Wrigley tomorrow night? Uh. <laughs> hmm. No, I, I, uh, I want to put myself in harm's way, but I'm going to be on huge amounts of LSD. <laughs> This is going to be a great show. <laughs> there are still tickets available, by the way. So, if you, uh, Kevin. All right, we're going to go to Jackie. I travel up here from St. Louis for today. What do you got? Jackie? Hi, such a huge fan. Uh, this question is kind of for Billy. When writing a song like American Idiot, do you think of the melody or do you have lyrics for it instead? Um, in general, I just I, melody kind of always comes first for me, and then. Um, the lyrics kind of make their way in. I kind of write lyrics down, just if anything comes to mind all the time, but uh, that's pretty much it. So, so uh, Billy, how does uh, being on Broadway compare to playing a Green Day show? Oh, uh, it's totally different. It's way easier being on Broadway. Really? Yeah. Well, for me it was. It was like the hard part was just when um, coming out is that you come out like uh, – it's like getting shot out of a cannon, and uh, but it, it's it's fun just to kind of like think about all the different um, actors and and uh, playwrights that have gone through like the St. James Theater, and uh, but uh, there it's two completely different things really. But I mean, you get to sing, so, right? So did it, did it blow you away just going like, you know, I kind of wrote this album. I kind of I did write this album and. Now I'm performing it on Broadway. I, I mean, I felt like the most arrogant bastard on the planet. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'll be starring in my own Broadway show. Thank you very much. Yeah. A one-man show <laughs> with other people in it. Yeah. <laughs> Out of my way. <laughs> nah, it was it was great. It was one of the best experiences for sure. Cool, Kevin. All right, so we're gonna go over to Shane. Shane, what do you got? Hi guys, um, I was curious. What uh, songs backstory is your favorite? Which one? What, what songs backstory is your favorite? What songs backstory? What yeah. song? Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, like a funny song or? There's like. All by myself is kind of funny. Oh, the backstory? Like what? Okay, so <laughs> I had headphones on, and I had a pair of uh, girls' underwear over my eyes, <laughs> and I was I was masturbating <laughs> in, in my room, and when I finished, my dinner was at the foot of my bed. <laughs> My mom had come and put my dinner at the foot of my bed. I, and so I wrote her this song. <laughs> it's all by myself. But I wasn't all by myself. That's what makes it funny. <laughs> I want a gal just like the gal that married dear old dad. <laughs> Yeah, you, you can't top that. That's a, that's the best backstory I've ever heard. Lauren, you got a listener with a this question? This is Brad from Chicago. Hey, guys. Um, oh. So what was a greater experience, uh, winning your first Grammy or getting inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Definitely the Hall of Fame. The Hall Since of fame. the Grammy... Uh, the Grammys came in the mail. I didn't even know we were nominated, and they, they came. <laughs> somebody just mailed them to us later on, and the tags were all crooked on them. And I'm like, "Oh, great! We'll probably never win another one of those again." <laughs> but you know, long, lo and behold, um, yeah, yeah, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which is cool because we were just there like yesterday yep. or day before, and uh, we got the bookmobile uh, back together and and in good shape, and that's parked out in front of the Rock Hall right now, and we're gonna auction it off for uh, 
Wheels for Wishes coming up pretty soon. So. Very cool. Lou? I mean, just tagging off that, Grammys, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, playing Wrigley Field tomorrow night, horse hot dogs in Poland, Dimitri. <laughs> What's next for Green Day? Where, where's the sky for Green Day? Where's the, where's the ceiling for you guys? We don't really look at it as having... You know, it's, we, it's having a ceiling or the sky or whatever. We're, I, we just like playing. I mean, if we didn't play, I had no idea what to do with my life at all. So it's like I have a, I don't even have a high school education. So it's best that I stick to my day job. And um, we just love what we what we do, you know. So I think people are asked, like, like w with all the like achievements and, and all that stuff. I mean, uh, it's when you when you're kind of a messy person um you tend to like doing something like playing music to kind of keep the clutter down i guess and uh that's why i recommend prednisone <laughs> <laughs> there you go tomorrow night wrigley field catfish in the bottom and opening up w anything special planned gonna uh or are you going to keep everything it a special planned? I mean, we're going to pull out all the stops, and we have you know the uh, the show is definitely built up a lot bigger and a lot more um, exciting. More, I don't want to give anything away, but there's a lot. We brought in a lot more production, and it's going to be a lot of fun. Awesome! Can't hardly wait. There are still tickets available, and they're cheap too. You guys always do a great job of keeping ticket prices affordable. Is well, that it's a ballpark? <laughs> it is. It is at a ballpark. <laughs> <laughs> These are cheap. You got to stay within the ballpark. <laughs> They're cheaper tickets than what you can get for the Cubs, for sure. Um, but is that something that you guys, like, it's it's important to you that you keep the ticket prices affordable to the, everybody? Yeah, we do the best that we can. Um, um, you know, it, it, what I always think about it is the people that, that are true, like, rock fans and rock and roll fans are uh, working class people. So it's like, I've been to, to shows by other bands where it's the, the price is jacked up so high and it looks like, um, it looks like a bunch of people that are from the office right. that are like weekend warrior kind of, uh, which is, I don't have anything against that, but it kind of eliminates the core people that are, are, uh, into your band, I guess. It, it looks weird when it, uh, when it looks <laughs> when like they're Wall all wearing Street. ties. Yeah, it's like Wall Street. Yeah, you know, it's like I would take my tie and put it around my head. And <laughs> Quick, ring the bell. Like, Guns and Roses, you know. <laughs> well, it's going to be an amazing show tomorrow night. Can't wait to see it, guys. Thanks so much for taking some time to hang with us this afternoon. Give it up for Green Day in the Sound Lounge. Thanks. <laughs>